are going to start the work session five. It will have three presentations, each one with 20 minutes. The first one is the authors are Anna Louisa Holling, it's the speaker, yes? yes? From Pernambuco Federal University from Brazil. Um, Luisa Morin, also Pernambuco Federal University. E, uh, and Maria Julia Jaborandi from uh, UNICAP Pernambuco Catholic University, Brazil also. The subject is the Galleria Progressive in the Salomon Guggenheim Museum and the Museum of Unlimited Growth. The speaker is, as I said, Anna Luisa Rowling. Well, the discussion will take uh, place after the three presentations, the same uh, in the morning. Um, thank you and good luck, Anna. Hello, good afternoon. I, I promise I'll try to keep everybody awake after lunch. Um, the paper we present here today is a, a little portion of my ongoing PhD thesis. Um, we're going to talk about two sort of case studies, uh, um, the Guggenheim Museum and the Museum of Unlimited Growth um, by, everybody knows, by Le Corbusier and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, the, the main focus is the idea of the Galleria Progressiva, which will clarify as we go here uh, what this type of space is. Um, so, in the thesis uh, that we are working on, there's two sort of uh, uh, axes. One is the, the morphology, and the other one is neuroscience related. We are currently doing the morphological um, analysis of uh, spaces, and the second uh, phase will carry um, the remaining tests. So, this is kind of uh, mid to, not early stages, but mid stages of uh, the research that we'll talk about here. Um, so these are the two projects we'll discuss uh, using basically space syntax uh, uh, procedures and uh, theoretical grounds. Why we chose these projects? Um, they are two, the examples are very well known uh, emblematic examples of uh, museums that although they have the same um, um, uh, distinct shapes, they both follow the, the logic of the, the spiral uh, and uh, what we're arguing, the, the, the logic of the, the Galleria Progressiva. Um, <clears throat> we're also interested in discussing it about this type of space, because at least in, in the field of syntax, um, there's a tendency of saying that this type of sequential space is very deterministic and uh, controlling in regards to the visitor's options uh, or of routes to move around the space. Uh, so two questions. Uh, we are approaching in this paper. The first one is, uh, <clears throat> which one of the two layouts is more favorable to engagement? And which sort of particularities in the configuration of these two examples lead to that? Um, so we'll talk briefly about the Galleria Progressiva historically, uh, just to give you a, a, a brief overview of that. Uh, <clears throat> then the two projects in relation to that concept. Um, <clears throat> following the analysis and then uh, some conclusions. So this is the Guggenheim and we begin with this picture. It's, uh, uh, it shows what the space is capable of doing, or at least the rotunda. So this girl is, uh, well, we don't know what she's doing. This woman is looking over the, the, the space. This other one is looking down. So this is a very enigmatic uh, um, image to us that kind of uh, drove the idea behind investigating how people engage in museums and uh, with artwork and the space itself. And uh, to me, he says something really um, key to understanding the space. Uh, I can't really see much here, but uh, uh, he says that basically it's the movement of bodies in space that defines the space in the Guggenheim. And that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was very aware of it when he designed uh, the space. Um, last, last year in Lisbon, we discussed the current uh, layouts after the additions and uh, the original ones. In this paper, we're just talking about the original ones, which is at the time that the museum opening, 1959, and we'll compare that to the um, uh, Le Corbusier's layout. This is the other project. Uh, 
We'll talk about these two specific layouts, the ground floor and uh, mostly the top floor, the main floor where the galleries are. Um, before uh, uh, moving to the projects themselves, we we'll talk about uh, a little bit about the Galleria Progressiva. And to understand the Galleria Progressiva, we have to go back to uh, the 19th century public museum. That's a big change in museums, uh, we probably know. Um, <clears throat> The 19th century itself, it's a century of knowledge that's uh, it's very uh, unique moment in museums because first the big museums are initially uh, purposely built to be museums, designed and built to be museums. And the idea of uh, showing uh, artwork sequentially, sort of following a historic uh, um, <clears throat> sequence. So that's really uh, the early days of what we are uh, calling the Galleria Progressiva or in English, the Progressive Gallery. I'm using Galleria Progressiva because that's mostly how uh, scholars have been referring uh, to. So some scholars, I just listed some here, they talk about two types of uh, spaces in museum. One is a period room, which we are not going to talk about here. And the other one is the Galleria Progressiva. Just very briefly, the period room is uh, uh, the more typical enfilade of rooms where um, the geometry of the building does not directly guide um, the visitor, whereas the Galleria Progressiva is pretty much the simple rule of uh, following the artifacts and the artworks by uh, the building geometry. So there's less external uh, clues and the geometry itself has uh, the ability to guide a visitor throughout the building. Um, <clears throat> so in this case of Galleria Progressiva, the, the, the the, the simple rule is that you follow uh, artifacts, objects, uh, progressively according to um, the simple rules of the building. In the case of the Guggenheim, as you all know, it's the spiral in the rotunda. As well as in the, in the Le Corbusier's project, it's the spiral uh, in the top floor. Um, and Galleria Progressiva can take uh, different shapes, uh, although there's also variations of the shapes, or combinations of the shapes, like helical structures, straight line or vaulted tunnels, concentric squares, and variations of these concentric uh, uh, possibilities. Uh, of course, the kind of space, uh, art space, uh, has precedence even before the 18th century, but they were not designed to be public museums. And we can see that in private uh, residences or palaces. And, but the type of space was there already. Like, uh, I think this is the antiquarium here, the other one. Or in the Louvre, if we see in the back here, there's a vaulted tunnel. And uh, as opposed to one might think, it's a very engaging space where people are looking at each other, I guess sewing here, talking, moving. Um, it's not a static. And Going back to the closer examples where we're going to uh, analyze today is the concentric uh, variations. We have some precedents as well. This is the uh, Pio Clementino at the, in the Vatican, uh, Boulez, uh, <coughs> Durand's, um, this Germany museums. Uh, and uh, <coughs> some uh, authors argue that the, the Guggenheim represent like the first time that a museum, an uh, art museum, it uh, fully applies this idea of a progressive gallery. Uh, just images of the history of the Guggenheim. We don't have time to go through that. But these are the guys who found it. You have Solomon, his wife, Hila and Kandinsky, uh, Kandinsky, which is the first uh, work in the collection that ended up creating the Guggenheim Museum. Comes from was bought here, I guess, this date of this photograph. Uh, so the museum was not built to be uh, as it is today, it was built to be a permanent gallery for a collection of uh, abstract art. Um, in terms of design, um, it went through a bunch of schemes, um, but basically following the same party with variations of hexagons and the circles of the big tower and the monitor. They, at some point they were switched, but pretty much following the same um, um, idea, the same party. And uh, the scheme A was the one that was further developed and led to the version we all see today uh, in New York City. 
So this was a previous version where you see the towers that were switched. And nowadays, it's the it's a big one is here, and the small one is on this side. Um, <clears throat> it, in regards to the spatiality of the museum, the most important thing is that the, the very deterministic rule of two um, main options of uh, sort of uh, going through this museum, which is up and down. And uh, according to this, Pevsner, which we all know, he says that even though the museum is spectacular, it's all about what a museum sh should not be, which is it does not allow for cross-line movements. And that's a big thing when we're going to uh, see here that in the example of Le Corbusier, even though it's a concept model, it wasn't built, these cross moves are much more allowed uh, by the same type of spiral <coughs> uh, plan. But at the same time that uh, it's very deterministic when it comes to how you access the museums, I'm talking about the Rotunda, of course, the museum has other galleries, although in the original project, those galleries were not thought about by Frank Lloyd Wright to be galleries. They were a library and other adjacency spaces. A couple of them were galleries. The, the increase of galleries adjacent to the Rotunda happened in the 90s after the big renovation project. So if we consider the Rotunda, it's pretty much up and down, and, and that's it. Uh, but then you have the voided space, this huge convex space here, and that's where all the action, uh, I would say, in terms of being, the Guggenheim being a social space, I would say even more than uh, an art space. Uh, that's when it happens. And you, so you see people uh, talking to each other, looking down, uh, looking across, and it's a very alive and active uh, space. So one wonders if it's really deterministic when it comes to how people experience that space. Even if, even if they experience themselves. Uh, and, uh, and we claim that Wright was very aware of this. If you, if, you, if you read his letters, which is a great source, I have time to go through many of them, just this one. He, he, he totally claims that the museum should be designed under this idea of movement when he says that it's a, it's a wheelchair going around and up and down throughout, no stops anywhere. And then, so it's a walk through art. Uh, <clears throat> other ideas where he talks about the museum as a social space, uh, the association with movement is always there, and a sort of idea that art and architecture could be in a balanced scale. And again, I don't know if you can see the little lines that I put here, but if you, this is the kind of space that Wright uh, sketched and came down. People, uh, the, the eyesights are uh, trans, trans Forcing the, the trespassing the uh, atrium, they're looking at each other, they're looking at art. So it's a very dynamic and uh, environment. Here, I, I did a bunch of uh, site observations, and in the Lisbon paper, that's what we talked about. We followed people uh, uh, besides the morphological analysis, and it's very interesting to see the way people interact. This woman is being photographed by somebody here, all across from the atrium. Um, <clears> then <throat> the, the other project is the Museum of Unlimited Growth. Um, the museum is, a, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about this one specifically, which is a scheme. It wasn't built, uh, but it's, a, it's part of 20 other projects. Altogether, it's 20 museum projects that Le Corbusier did using the spiral as a, a starting point. Uh, and he also studied the spiral, not as, it's very common that when you read about the Museum of Unlimited Growth, there's an analogy with organic or shapes of nature, which is probably there. But his idea, when it comes to the spiral, not only in museum projects, but other projects, was to study circulation patterns. And there's a bunch of uh, uh, <coughs> uh, sketches and studies for many, many projects where we see this idea in hand-drawn uh, lines, experimenting with patterns oh. of circulation. This one here is for the Museum of Unlimited Growth. So, so the museum is, uh, is a combination of a spiral that goes around here with a swastika. That's what m much of the literature says. We have these four axes. 
and from those axes you can look out or you can break through the spiral. Um, that's the geometry of the building. Um, I just want to show, because the video didn't work. Uh, I don't know if I can show you really quick here. Uh, I don't know where she put it. Let's see if I can find it. Sorry. to the atrium. I can't pause it. Okay. I just want you to take a quick look here and then I'll go, I'll go back to this before we start. It's a shame that it's not working. Okay. So the idea is that you enter here and you are completely blinded uh, from the exterior. You're directed to the middle of the building, which is the atrium, which I saw in the quick video. And then you go up to this, through that ramp, you go up, and then you go around the galleries here. And in the Guggenheim, you enter freely, and then you find the ascending point, and then you go up. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm gonna show you the rest of the video, so, and then I'll just, because. I think it's easy. Okay, now it's not working. Okay, thank you. How much time do I have? This is a very simple model we did uh, using the documentation from the Fondation Le Corbusier. So it's pretty much an interpretation other than 100% accurate in terms of, uh, we did, we tried to do it as, as much as we could, but it's an interpretation of the space. So this is the atrium, and then you start to go around, um, you, you start to hit the spiral and go around. And this, uh, you start to see these openings so you break through the spiral instead of being blinded by the walls and, and f having a more forceful trajectory like it happens in the Guggenheim. Even though you can't see, in that case, you have to keep going up and down uh, because you have the parapet as a barrier. Okay. That's the exit to the museum. So that's the breakthrough here from those uh, axes that we couldn't stop in the video. Uh, <clears throat> so in the analysis, uh, we did a couple of convex axial uh, visibility graph and, and, uh, and justified graph analysis of both, both cases. I'm going to go really quick through it. Um, <clears throat> in terms of convex spaces, uh, we didn't think about that before at the beginning, but this is a much more complex scheme because you have many more, the amount of convex spaces in this case and the variation of them is much bigger than this one. This one you have basically one single space. Uh, we, uh, as uh, one single space takes up 50% of the space in the rotunda. I'm, I'm looking more right here, which I'm calling the rotunda, but we did the analysis for the whole system as you know, all the spaces in the system and just for the atria the, of both projects. I can see. Um, so I have to sit down here because I can't really see that. Uh, so in both, both cases, most, uh, the most connected spaces, they're all around the atria. That's something we expected to find. Um, and uh, the, the results show that. These are the, the graphs for both projects. And to look at this graph, we went back to Hillier, uh, Space to Machine, and we looked at four types of spaces. Hillier uh, analyzes spaces as they are located in the rings of movement, and uh, saying that the A spaces are dead end spaces, B 
are connected to two or more spaces, but uh, uh, not in a ring. C and D are, I would say, better for uh, the capacity of the space to promote more integration and, and uh, people to have more route opportunities or variations. And looking at both cases, uh, we found out that Ma the Museum of Unlimited Growth, it has uh, both more C spaces and D spaces, therefore uh, concurring to a more uh, integrated system as a whole. It's not that the Guggenheim isn't integrated, but comparing to the other one, then we find some uh, slight differences. Um, <clears throat> and uh, other details that we could get from this analysis was that both uh, atriums here and here, they're in very, very shallow positions of the system, so very easily accessible. Here, uh, in the Le Corbusier's project, you have to walk a metric longer uh, distance to hit the atrium, but relatively they're both in uh, shallow positions of the system. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, Integrated spaces, it's pretty much the same logic that the atria uh, designs the system. It's all around them in both cases. And uh, so we, and then we broke down the spaces for integrations and connectivity. And then to do that, these are photographs from the atrium taking, taken in every 10 seconds, or yeah, I believe so, for about uh, an hour or so. And we overlapped the highly integrated lines from the analysis with positioning of people and there's, you know, people tend to stay in the heated spaces of the integration analysis, so it's quite interesting. Um, looking at uh, intelligibility of systems, the Guggenheim scored a little higher uh, and I think it has to do with the, the rotunda, uh, the big uh, the proportion of that space in relation to the others. Um, that is it. I also did VJ analysis, and um, it's uh, quite interesting to see that uh, Corbusier's scheme, you have these red points here. They represent dramatic changes in the visual uh, fields. So that concurs for a very interesting visit that is always surprising the visitor. So you go here, boom, you change, and so forth. While here, it's, it's more uh, even, except when you are in the middle of the atrium, then you have a, a, a specifically more... Uh, a bigger and extended visual field. Um, this is some isophys in atrium and, and the axis of the museum. Uh, so overall, uh, the, the Corbusier scheme is a more complex scheme when it comes to uh, convex uh, partition and, and uh, spaces uh, than the Guggenheim scheme. Um, uh, the exhibiting spaces here are much more, they, 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 they are much more complex too. If you think that all this is one big space, so one big space, so here you have this breakthrough of uh, spaces around the atrium. Um, and I think one of the most important things that we did not quite uh, expect it or didn't, because the project we had to, get to know this project as, as we model it and find out this sort of uh, particularities. So the uh, Corbusier scheme it promotes, uh, it, it allows for more cross tra line trajectories as opposed to the Guggenheim. This is a shot from the uh, one of the axes where you come out of the spiral and you can turn here or you can go up and you can see the outside, come back in. If you're bored, you can leave or keep going and you always be surprised by this four main axis in the system. Um, in regards to the Galleria Progressive, I would say that the Corbusier's project is more of an authentic, uh, really progressive gallery. Uh, uh, if you compare it to the Guggenheim, you have a hybrid of uh, period room and gallery, Galleria Progressiva because you have the rotunda and then you have these agen agencies that were added after or had the spaces changed to become also galleries. So, um, that was also a surprising, surprising um, uh, fact. Um, when we tracked people at the Guggenheim, uh, we realized that people spend much more time in the other galleries here than actually in the rotunda. So um, that was something that it's probably because they're bored somehow at the, at the rotunda. We don't know yet. We have to do more simulations and, and tests, but that's what we found out. So I tracked people and could, could see that people
people actually do spend more time in the adjacency period rooms than the, the gallery. Um, so I guess I talked about that already. Uh, so in the end, we believe that the Museum of Limit Growth is more favorable to engagement and then the rights hybrid system of, of the Galleria Progressiva in the period room because it, uh, it, has, it offers a more exploratory visit by maximizing uh, both root options and changes in visual fields. Um, so just to finish, these are the next steps of the, the research uh, where we're, go we're going to test some variations, form of variations of the Galleria Progressiva. I'm not gonna show that much because that's for next seminar, hopefully. And uh, test some of these and see if what we found in the, these uh, basic schemes uh, kind of match or they're gonna differ too much from some variations and, and uh, crisscross that with some neuroscientific aspects that have to do with revealing more about uh, how people engage in space. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Luisa Pauline. Now the next speaker is Petros Kotsolampro. Uh, with, the with the presentation, participant indoor space using visibility graphs investigating user behavior in office spaces. The authors are Petros Kotsolampros from Space Syntax Lab from the Bartlett School Architecture, Kirsten Saylor also from Space Syntax Lab, Bartlett School Architecture, and Tassos Varodis also from Space Syntax Lab. Okay, good luck. Thank you. So hi, I'm Petrus. I'm also doing a PhD, and my general theme is office spaces, and I'm trying to find a relationship between human behavior and the configuration. So this presentation is just going to show you, this is a very specific paper on one specific thing that we did. Uh, it's going to uh, have the the context uh, and the existing research uh, of uh, surrounding this paper, the aim, uh, the description of the data set, the new methodology that we are suggesting, uh, statistical analysis as some future work. So the general context is that uh, architects seem to want more evidence-based design practices. The different studies that have been done showed that uh, some of the participating architects wanted to know more about new tools, uh, and a lot of them perceived the need to, for, for evidence in the design process. But how can we uncover this relationship between human behavior and the configuration of space? Um, a lot of it has started with actually capturing human behavior. You can just do manual observations. You can have different sensors and cameras and all sorts of different ways. But then the question becomes, how do you actually relate this to space? Uh, one of the, two of the classic space syntax representations are axial lines and convex maps. They were suggested by Hillier and Hanson in the social logic of space. And uh, the axial lines, of course, are the fewest and longest lines of sight that go through every space. And the convex maps are the fewest and largest convex spaces and they are complementary to the above the axial lines. And the way to correlate human behavior with this is in the axial lines you find uh, which line uh, an activity is happening close to and you associate it with the line, then you can aggregate based on the line. In the convex spaces you just measure the amount of people inside the convex space and then you can correlate with the different uh, configuration properties. Uh, unfortunately, these um, representations are quite abstract. And for example, axial lines are better suited for linear spaces, and they mostly represent movement. And convex maps are made convex, therefore they usually lack detail. They have to be uh, made abstract. They're also ambiguous in their construction, as Peponis has shown. That's a, an example over there, that you can split the same type of space with for different ways. Um, so one of the new representations created was the visibility graph analysis. It was suggested by Turner in 2001. And it has an underlying lattice grid. 
and every cell in the grid is connected to every other cell it can see. So if they are intervisible, they are connected, it creates a graph underneath. That gives us a uniform unit of analysis, one cell, and it gives us a choice on the detail we want to capture. If we want a lot of detail, we get a small cell. If we want not, not, not a lot of detail, we get a larger cell. Unfortunately, this, exactly, this is exactly the problem that smaller cells can capture a lot of detail, but not enough people to aggregate the results. So for example, in, in the above picture, you can see that a person standing the blue dot can be thought of either, either in cell B or in any of the other four, or the, or the other three, but if we do it deterministically, it's going to fall on one cell. And if we do it that way with a lot of small cells, it will, they will gather in very few cells. If we do it, uh, with um, larger cells, we capture many more people, but not enough detail. The extra problem we have with larger cells is that um, it creates problems with openings. So in the bottom picture, you can see the, the space above is considered a different space to the uh, more light um, cells below because it cannot pass through the opening. We actually tried using um, human behavior and VGA in uh, previous research. Uh, in, in the above image that you see is uh, we smoothed out the result from the activity and we applied this to the VGA, which was one way. And the below, uh, we used the cells directly as they were. This is for a 45 by 45 uh, cell grid, 45 centimeters. Uh, but none of these gave us any interesting results. So, the aim of this paper is to create a solution that retains the detail afforded by visibility graph analysis, but also allows us to meaningfully uh, study human activity by aggregating where we find people. So we suggest a hybrid between the visibility graph analysis and convex maps, in a sense, so that we have larger areas that we can aggregate human behavior against. The, we, we evaluate our results uh, with a specific data set. This is uh, 29 office spaces across the UK and in 34 sites, so there's different cities and different uh, parts of the UK. This is provided by Space Lab, uh, an architectural office and consultancy for workplaces that collects this data. We examine this, this is the fourth paper <laughs> that we examine the same data set. And we have the location of teams, the image above, then we have visibility graph analysis and we, have, we capture where people are sitting, standing, interacting, uh, general snapshots. So the new methodology that we suggest is, is a specific process, take the VGA, take its uh, distribution and split it in two. That gives us uh, areas of low connectivity and high connectivity, for example, or visual mean depth. It just allows us to split the areas in two. Uh, the third step is to take those areas and um, create uh, discrete um, areas that are not connected. So the previous ones, the ones that you see here, uh, the two blue larger areas would, we would consider as different areas because they're not actually adjacent. The last step of the process is to also take into account whether these um, these areas are actually accessible. So we, we take into account the walls. So that gives us the final result, which you see on the right there. We did a few examples in uh, some sample plans. What you see above is the, uh, the actual plans. Then it's the, the metric that we get from visibility graph analysis. The, the third row is the splitting it into two. And the last one is with the blob detection algorithm. Um, so we tested across a few scenarios to see if our representation gives us anything. We tested with two metrics, the visual mean depth, which is the um, average number of turns to go from one point in the building to any other point in the building, and the connectivity, which is the amount of space we can see from any specific point in the building. Unfortunately, specifically for visual mean depth, you can see that the distribution is, uh, uh, the lines are not very visible, but the distribution is uh, heavily skewed to the right. So we uh, 
to, we, we, we tested different ways of splitting the distribution, one with the mid-range, which is the minimum and maximum divided by two. Um, but unfortunately, that created very, very small areas because, as you can see, we have very few cells on the right part of the distribution, the, the blue ones as well. We tested the median. We sp split the distribution exactly in half. So that gives you half and half cells. And we also have the mean, which is a compromise between the two. So that gives us exactly nine testing scenarios for the three metrics, for the two metrics, connectivity, visual mean depth, and a combination of the two. Uh, three uh, different splits for each metric. And that leaves us with um, six t-tests and uh, three ANOVAs, the t-test because we only have two things to compare, the other one because we have four things to compare, low, high, high, low, and all the combinations that you can get. Um, these are the statistical results for, the, for, we're specifically studying movement in this case, so it's the number of people moving uh, divided by, by the amount of space that is in with, within that area, and Whatever is red is significant. It's not very visible now, lots of numbers. Uh, but as you can see, all, all the t different testing scenarios are significant, um, independent of the split. Um, what we do get, though, is uh, consistency, saying that low connectivity, those are areas where, the, where we cannot see a lot of space, uh, attract less movement. In the visual mean depth uh, case, so this is more central spaces attract more people movement, m moving. This might seem obvious, but <laughs> this is an actual statistical result. And we get the, uh, consistent results for the combined metric, except maybe for, uh, I think, the visual mean depth mean, which has a slight change in the end. Uh, but in all cases, the um, way the, the uh, movement comes is in specific uh, types of spaces. Uh, we tested, so that the previous one was for every single case that we have, for the 29 cases. This one is for each case separately. Any red ones you see are uh, the significant results. Any gray ones you see are non-significant results. Um, what we, we observe is that larger cases tend to follow the general results that we saw before. Um, which might point to a um, critical mass required for the project so that we can see this uh, pattern appearing. And we find that most cases are significant when we split by the mean. So that might be the best way if we are uh, trying to find patterns in one specific project and not in a general office sample. We also tested for interaction. So there's a numbers of people interacting divided by the amount of space. Uh, it's not as consistent as movement. As you can see, there's only three metrics that are uh, actually significant. The mid-range, which is the uh, third from last, is uh, we don't really consider it. We have here for completeness, but because it splits the distribution very unevenly, we don't keep it. So we only have essentially two significant scenarios, connectivity by mean depth and the combined by mean. Um, the first scenario shows us that fewer people in, are interacting in low connectivity, that's small areas. And the second scenario that's significant is that most people are interacting, most people interacting were found in high connectivity areas. Those are uh, large areas and highly visual. I mean, those are not very central areas. Again, we did the same thing, interaction case by case. And as you can see here, the results are much more uh, non-significant. There's no detectable patterns. So there's not much to say about this. So in a summary, the results is that the aggregation reduced the noise found in previous studies, the ones that you saw in the beginning. We managed to capture sufficient detail to identify different types of spaces. So we can separate between small and large central and non-central spaces. We identified how predictable the two uh, behaviors are. Uh, movement tends to be more predictable, it seems. Um, more specifically, movement was found 
to happen more in visible and central spaces. And this is a contradiction to previous studies that found more movement in more segregated areas. For future work, we will examine every single case, well, at least a sample of them, uh, more closely to identify different idiosyncrasies that exist within the sample. So some cases are a little bit different for some other reason, so that should allow us to incorporate other types of data that could, that affects these idiosyncrasies. Uh, these could be different types of spaces, locations of attractors, etc. We would like to test other visibility graph analysis metrics. There's a lot of them. <laughs> There's an isovist metric and angular. And finally, we would like to find a more elegant solution for creating the areas, such as randomly selected continuous areas of specific sizes instead of taking the visibility graph and splitting it. Thank you. Now, the next speaker is Janet Hitman. Um, the presentation has the title of Complex Buildings and Cellular Automata a cellular automation model for the saint croix Paris. The author, author sorry, are Roberto D'Artilia, yes, correct, and Janet Hitman from the, the both are from Roma Tree University. Thank you. Okay. Um, I will read the text just because it is important to respect the time I had and even to say everything I have to, so I'm sorry. Well, the title of the, um, the, the research I'm going to present is, as I already said, Complex Building and Cellular Automata. And this title is also enlight the two elements and two components that reveals two disciplines that we try to merge uh, through an application of cellular automated model and uh, on the case study uh, chosen. And this is, it is the one I'm working for my PhD. So um, the approach of the research is to look at the complex collective phenomena at an architectural scale and not only anymore at the urban one. Uh, during this research, I saw that um, if in the city's practices were increasing a lot, we can say uh, that the same proliferation phenomenon uh, could be observed in a minor scale about uses in, our, in buildings. So in the work, um, here presented, we consider um, only what in literature has been identified as complex building type. It means that um, we are talking about incubators of uses and in which there is a strong pro program core uh, able to organize uses into dynamic configuration and in a, on a spatial temporal line. Uh, with this research, I will show you uh, under what condition a complex building can be studied, described, and supported by an application of formal methods and cellular automata. And, um, and I'm doing so in order to, uh, first of all, describe and manage the building's configuration with a, with a, with a nine number of different type of uses planted at the same time. And the second, because it is important to improve the compatibility between these different kind and type of uses planted uh, in the building. Um, so uh, I believe that our findings are significant because um, rega basically be, uh, regarding the application of formal methods to an architectural scale, uh, and it reveals that the building performs with an, an urban behavior. And even because uh, of, of, of the statistical treatment to this scale is becoming maybe a new field of study as it's clear in this uh, symposium. Well, uh, just a few words about the case study because uh, the saint quatre Paris is uh, nowadays a socio-cultural artistic center and it is a public building but it can uh, behave like a public private one. It is located in the northeast, northeast of the city and that is the poorest one of, of, the, of, of the city of, of Paris. Um, the original building was built in the middle of the 19th century as the only funeral home of the city. Well, this is a in, very interesting and particular story because uh, after the French Revolution, it was decided in France uh, to make uh, the funeral as a public service. And because of that in Paris, uh, was realized this uh, 39,000 square meters building. Uh, it worked for more than a century until 1998, 
And during the last uh, years of his, its life, uh, it was inserted to the list of historical buildings uh, of, the, of, the, of the France, basically because of if its uh, monumental indoor spaces. Uh, as you can see in the images, uh, it, it seems that here, the central part is, uh, was, con um, is, was designed like a, um, a sort of yard, yard of, of the building. So um, in, the time, in the 2008, the city uh, decided to convert the building into a cultural uh, center, uh, like the other French intervention of adaptive, adaptive reuse of industrial uh, fish, like the most famous uh, one that is called in, uh, La Belle de Mai in Marseille. Um, the rehabilitation project process was the result of a French procedure named uh, Marche de Définition. It is very important to say that because it was used to, um, uh, to, to be applied to large urban areas project. And for the saint Quatre, it was the first time that it was used on a building and in the city of Paris. So um, for the program side, uh, the building was configured, configured uh, in order to allocate private or public activities and for a cultural, artistic, and social purpose. So it is very uh, large, the program, the program of the building, and even because it is a very huge uh, building, so um, it is even for that. From the architectural project, uh, as you can see in the, in the plan, it is important to say two main architectural characteristics that are uh, this sort of yard, uh, that is designed and used even as a sort of public spaces and even for the porosity uh, to the urban scale because it have two main entrances uh, that are um, that gave this porosity to the to the city so uh, the San Catre is, um, is able to allocate a number of almost infinite possible configuration of uses this is how the director of the San Catre, José Manuel González, is, is used to say. And it means that the program is the result of the combination between their proper uh, activities and other activities they don't, they don't know in advance. Um, going deep into the description of the relation between uh, uses and spaces, we have to say that the direction merged into the, into the program 12 types of activities divided in three main families and the 39,000 of square meters are partially uh, passionate and partially free. Uh, so um, the, uh, the type of activities are even uh, different uh, in uh, temporality because there are activities that are oc occasionally, that are recurrent or permanent, or permanent. This is why each configuration can be unique mm -hmm. and it depends all the time from the immanent part pattern of activity of activities that the direction have to combine into, into the program. And this is why it is uh, very dynamic and why it changes all the time uh, and because, um, and it is uh, even uh, why the, each configuration has to be very, very different and um, has, uh, each one has the ability to attract, to attract different public. Uh, it, it is important to say that uh, each configuration and for each day, um, this, uh, this building and this institute can attract between 5,000 and 15,000 persons per day. So it is very, very um, huge number. Um, so, uh, so the number of uses, we say that it is a lot because there are artistic, social and economic uh, uh, part of, of uses and even the, the number of spaces are very different because the, it is, uh, there is this large uh, and central uh, spaces that it used like a public one, but it is used even to allocate uh, external uses and external activities. And there are also the, as you can see here, the black one that are uh, different kind and different sides of room. So, um, the number of uses and the number of space, spaces can, um, can, give the, um, can be com combined to have many configuration, uh, many, kind, many kind of configuration. And as the director say, this number is almost infinite, but 
is a sociologist and we are not, so we uh, had the, the possibility to calculate it and the number you can see uh, under the slide is exactly the number that we can consider as the possible configuration of the, of the uses into this space. So uh, this almost infinite number, it is um, showed the, the, the possible configuration and depending on, on the program, they can change a lot of time even during the same day. So to understand that, uh, it, it was um, important to describe and capture the phenomena. Um, and in order to do that, we use an hybrid methodology uh, mixing qualitative and quantitative tools. Uh, first of all, we draw a chronotopic map of the, of the sun cut showing the real configuration flow. These are some screenshots of, um, of this chronotopic map. And uh, then through the knowledge uh, that from the qualitative uh, data, um, it has been possible to translate uh, this qualitative data into a quantitative one and apply the cellular automated model. model. Um, differently from the cellular automata in which the main rule is that the change of a state uh, of a cell depends from the nearby one, in our case the modification of the state of an area it depends from uh, the state of all the areas of the configuration. So for this reason, after a six-month observation of the behavior of the, um, of the institute, it has been possible to, uh, possible to analyze in deep two months, February and March of 2017, um, and translate 58 daily planning sheets, like this one. It is very, very uh, little, but uh, each uh, daily sheet had uh, a number of around nine and 11 configuration because there are the, uh, the timeline and the sp special line. So um, 58 number of daily uh, report, uh, it means a uh, huge number. It means 53 um, um, per uh, 11 configurations. So it is a huge number. And in this way, it, is, it has been possible to rebuild um, 50 real configuration with the activities allocated uh, by type, temporal extension, a spatial envelope, and associate, associate to each configuration the number of people who visit the building and or uh, participated to per each configuration. Because another kind of data we had, there were this uh, daily report, uh, this one, uh, it is a descriptive day, daily report, but they, um, the direction chose to do that every day and to collect even the, the quantitative uh, data about the, per, the people uh, attracted by each configuration. So um, uh, each configuration is recorded graphically as uh, we showed before. Um, in, uh, in, 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 as in the figure uh, are showing in the, in the slide. For the first, the plan is divided into a 352 square boxes. It is the number of the sub-areas sub we divide the San Cater plan. And each, activities, uh, each activity has its proper envelope. And um, for second, by attributing to each square, uh, one of the 12 colors to indicate the type of the activity. Uh, the example that we show, we show here are uh, 16 of the five, uh, 50 real configuration and, it, uh, and to each one is associated, associated uh, to a number of visitors. Um, the, the aim of the reconstruction of the real configuration was to um, estimate the network of relationship between areas and because of that, we calculate the possi possible value of the configura configuration not yet tested. So the six, the last six one. Um, in under, um, then in order to understand which model is the most re reliable, we exploit four possible models for, of machine learning. Um, as you can see there, maybe, but there are linear regression, uh, nearest neighbor, neural network, and random forest. 
Well, uh, with the data and graphical description of configuration, the predictors have been trained mm. to learn the images with the information linked to the spatial dis uh, disposition, the type of use, mm. and the number of visitors. In particular, we trained the four mm. machine learning models to associate the 50 uh, real uh, Sankatar configuration to corresponding uh, the number of visitors and then use uh, the predictors obtained to predict the number of the visitor of the six real configuration here show it. So as in light in the slide, maybe, yeah, the last one, um, the most reliable model is the random forest, even if the number are still too far from the real one, basically because of the limited number of data we had. By the way, um, the results are very encouraging, uh, even, with a small, with, even with this small uh, number of data. And they suggest a uh, deepen application of, uh, by using more data. It is important even to underline uh, how the failure of the linear regression shows uh, that the behavior of automaton um, is deeply nonlinear. It means that a very small change in the state can cause a, bit, a big change in the number of visitors. So the random forest model seems to capture this nonlinearity uh, better than the, than the other uh, predictors. And we can identify uh, it as an effective method that allow us to say that um, the statistical treatment applied to uh, the scale of the building is possible and it can be applied in the next year in the type of building or serve it in order to uh, pre-evaluate the compatibility between uses into the space and the effect of even configuration. So uh, in conclusion, um, this experiment can be summarized with the three main conclusions. The first one about the complexity in architecture, that what it refers uh, to and how it can be managed. Uh, I mean, um, it means that building can have the same complexity than urban scale, as, and as incubators of uses, they can have a deeply nonlinear behavior. Uh, so machine learning technique can be used to coding it, um, and with, the, with an application of big data mining with artific artificial intelligence. The second conclusion is how this complexity can be used to improve the results, because random forest predictor can be used as an instrument of measuring the effect of planning and pre-evaluated uh, the compatibility between uses. It means it could be applied uh, to an acoustic uh, um, compatibility or normative or even an er energetic one and the configuration of value uh, that can be economical, uh, social, or wherever it, it can be studied. And the third uh, conclusion is what are the more influent, uh, is about the more influent architectural component that enable this complexity. Uh, the complexity in, in architecture um, and in this kind of complex building is highly supported by the indoor uh, public space uses uh, use it and as public space, even if it is a private one. Um, this pseudo public space receive a high uh, mixed people, people presence, uh, like in the urban public space. So uh, it became the attractive and the, uh, the, the aesthetic attractive for the building and its purposes. So this is everything. So thank you for your attention. Uh, Anna, uh, when you said you, um, within your research, uh, in a, a certain period, you start to track people, um, how, what kind of process did you, did you use to, to do that? You just follow people, you uh, did something else? How, how that tracking people process was made? several types of uh, tracking and site observations. One type of tracking, uh, the, the overall tracking, the, the bulk of it, was following uh, people from the start and just timing wherever they stopped and photographing. So that uh, it was uh, inobtrusive. So it was uh, very free, free, I would say. I just tried to pick different uh, types of users. 
tourists, locals, and we did 15 uh, uh, couples. And uh, I guess uh, five uh, people that were alone in the building. Um, yeah, and then I, I followed the tracking with maps, and these maps are being, we have to digitalize these maps, but they were just tracking, which in syntax, it's one of the things that uh, the site observations, they're very common is to track freely how people move and where they stop. So that's they, they space. That's the track. No. No, they no. didn't know they were no. it's in <laughs> and They didn't have any active role within the tracking process. No. no. Okay, so just you by observation. Yes. And I also did other types of observations in terms of which means of ascending the space people took, the ramp or the elevator. And the findings show that they most of them they prefer the ramp as opposed to what Wright had thought because he did design the building for people to ascend in the elevator and then go down in this kind of slow drift. And it's actually the opposite. They, they go up very slow and then they come back really fast, very looking at uh, art. But this type of discussion, uh, there was a syntax uh, symposium last, last year and then we talked about the site observations in a paper we wrote then this one. I was not, I couldn't put in all the information together with the other one because we couldn't do it for uh, Le Corbusier as yet. But in the next stages of the research, when we are trying to insert virtual reality to speculate more about Corbusier's scheme and variations of it to see what kind of, that kind of takes us in relation to how people, where people stop more and head movements, where do they look at and, and we'll see what happens. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Anna.